So today in our sandbox session, we are talking about stories of food with Lori McCarthy. Lori is the owner of the highly awarded and written about Cod Sounds. Her business is focused on telling the stories of Newfoundland and Labrador through food, often gathered through her renowned foraging experiences. Lori is no stranger to GMIST, having offered a number of culinary programs over the last few years, including Wild Wonders and Nature's Table, which some of you may have participated in. She is a great collaborator and a great storyteller and can now add author to her biography. I'm delighted to welcome Lori to the Sandbox sessions this morning and I'll turn the screen over to her. Thank you, Nora. Um, as for the camera work, yeah, I think what should happen is if you guys go up in your upper right hand corner, you should be able to click on speaker view and you should see two cameras side by side. One that has um, my hand, being all fluttery, and the other one is me. Now you can decide which one you want to look at, <laughs> but Nora's actually gonna jump back and forth in between if, if need be. Um, if anybody's on gallery right now, it might be helpful to uh, just give us a hands up if you guys can, when you click on speaker view, can you see both um, cameras? That might help Nora out because if we don't have to switch in between, we can actually just leave it like it is Nora, but. I'll leave that up to you and you can play with it and see how, uh, what people, what it is that people see. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I, uh, I usually, am uh, Lori McCarthy, I own a company called Cod Sounds, as Nora said. And, uh, you know, for some of us, we've been on a bit of a hiatus from our, from our businesses and I am the same. So, and I really struggled with, uh, you know, what to put back in the market after COVID and, and, and what business was going to look like with all these restrictions and stuff. And lots of times when I've been asked to speak in the last two years, um, I sort of talked about how I, you know, reinvented, if we all have to hear reinvented anymore, <laughs> it's starting to get hard to hear, but we all did and we had to and we figured it out along the way, but uh, if anybody knows Allie Blagden, my uh, my cousin, she owns a company called Alder Cottage. And Allie said to me actually a couple of weeks ago, she's like, we're always reinventing. She's like, we're entrepreneurs. You're always scrambling and changing and improving and learning. And and so that's kind of what it is. So I think you kind of be, we kind of become masters at, at it and as entrepreneurs and as DMOs and people in the industry who are trying to coach and, and economic development officers like, it's that's what it's about right it's that evolution of um how do we stay with with what it is that our audience wants and i think that's always something that's on my mind um so today in thought of sh instead of sharing kind of how i survived covid <laughs> i thought i would kind of give you um a bit of a an insight into what it is that i realized i always did um even before i kind of knew what i was doing and that piece is definitely uh, the storytelling piece. And, you know, I, I struggled with, you know, we hear it all the time. We're storytellers. It's all about our story and what our story is. And, and it, it really took um, a minute for me to kind of just stop uh, and think about what was that story that I was telling. And over the years, it's definitely become more solidified. And, um, and you know, during COVID, when, you, when I couldn't, take gangs of people out on the beach and feed them. It, and I thought, how am I gonna sort of show up as my business and how am I gonna show up for, you know, and do the work that I love to do? And I, it forced me to take, a, take some intentional time to think about what it is that I want people to walk away with after the time with me and what that story kind of looked like. Uh, I thought I would start with showing you one of the dishes that I make on the beach and, um, I've been making this for years and it's always a great sort of moment to share some of uh, some of that storytelling piece with you. And so for that other camera, for those of you who can see it, this is uh, an enormous scallop shell. And we have two kinds of scallops in Newfoundland. We have the Icelandic scallop, which is less popular. And this is what they just call the sea scallop. And so you can see how enormous these are. Um, there are three kinds of fisheries. There's a there's an ab Aboriginal fishery here. There's um, a commercial fishery, and then there's what they call a uh, re um, recreation fishery. So, I was always terrified of water. I learned about I learned to be terrified of water from my mom. She was uh, 
Mom could swim as long as she knew she could touch the bottom. So as long as in her mind, she knew she could touch, she could swim. The minute she couldn't touch the bottom, then she couldn't swim, she said. Uh, and I think it was one of those things that I forced myself to kind of get over as I grew up. And, uh, and actually, I was looking last night and Stan Cook spoke at the beginning of these series. And I actually um, thought that I went to work on one of the tour boats with O'Brien's back in the day. And then I went to work with Stan Cook and them. And we spent five days paddling up in the New World Islands, learning how to kayak, learning all kinds of rust rescue maneuvers and upside down and, and, you know, picking urchins off the bottom of the ocean floor. And that was my first introduction to really being um, that close and in the water and in situations where I had to figure out how to get out of it if I needed to and help other people get out of it. And so the last thing I did was, was force myself to learn to dive. And that was the most terrifying thing I've ever done. Um, and yet it, it gave me an insight to an underwater world that absolutely changed my life. And, you know, when you go dive in for your own food, it certainly makes you appreciate what it is that mm -hmm. you're about to eat. And so I share these scallops all the time. Um, either I'll dive for them myself or I have friends of mine that'll dive for them. And it gives, give us, gives us the opportunity to sort of, to hand pick, right? So you can, instead of picking all the little ones, like my grandfather would always say, when you go trout and you catch the little fish, he said, you know, put them back now. And he said, we'll catch them for next year. So it was always the message of leave the little ones, pick the big ones, you know, and, and it was that, and it's also that sustainability piece, right? Um, sometimes I, I question the, our methods around harvesting seafood. And this to me was some, was a product that I was super happy to serve. And so when I take people out on the beach, this is one of the ones we serve. So um, you, to open the scallop, you can use, uh, you almost need like an oyster, an oyster shucker really, They're quite, or, or a good heavy dive knife. And you come in here at the end like this and you give it a good snap. And when you do, you, you slide your, your knife in up along the top. There's two sides, one is, one is concave and, and one, well, one is, um, One's got a big deep shell, we'll say, and the other one is actually almost flat, and the top shell is almost flat here on this one. So when you pull it off and you, you scrape along the top of it, and then you open it up. Now, these three tiny scallops uh, um, are covering what would normally be one scallop. So this scallop in here, and you'll see actually from this one, you can see this ring right here, and this is how big these scallops are. And these are usually the size that we harvest because the next size up is, you know, it can be bigger than my hand, we'll say. And so that's the size we like to serve up. And this one, um, and there, I just have three little ones in here for you today. So I'm going to move some of this and over on the fire. Had we been all sitting around the fire this morning, um, having a cup of tea, I'd pull this rock off the fire, but I got it on the wood stove for this morning. Oh, this rock has had a lot of scallops cooked on it in the past year. <laughs> so one of the things I really love to make with guests when we're out on the beach is, uh, is seaweeds and kelp. And uh, this one here, and I, you know, I, I take the seaweeds, we pick them from the beach and we'll take them up to, um, up on shore where I, where I do all my excursions to, and we hang them on the clothesline. And I'm sure the crowd in Avondale never see the like a seaweed hanging on the clothesline before. But of course, it, it all adds to the, to the fun of it. And we'll hang all the, the seaweed on the clothesline. And then um, when it's dry, of course, I always have extra dried stuff put aside for people. These are, we'll take it and, uh, and we'll, we'll grind it up with just with the hand mortar and pestle. And we grind it up and make uh, seaweed salt. And then all the guests get to take home a little bit of seaweed salt. And then like I tell them, you know, that day, six months from now, when you haul that seaweed salt out of your fridge or out of your, out of your cupboard to make a dish for yourself, you'll remember your moments with me here on the beach, hopefully. And, uh, and when you cook up that piece of fish or those scallops that you cook, you'll get to tell all the people that you're sitting around with where the, where the seaweed salt came from. So this one's adults. Uh, we don't have a lot of adults in Newfoundland. You guys down the mainland get, get quite a bit of adults. And you can see the heat on the rock is actually shriveling it, shriveling it up a little bit. Um, 
And this one is, is an Alaria seaweed, and that's pretty popular. It's one of the sugar kelps, and this one is dried. Uh, and so those are one of the, those are two of the ones I really like to use. Now, let me move this up to the side. So I'm going to slice these scallops really thin, really thin. And this is always a great opportunity to, uh, to introduce people to a scallop that's not quite so cooked, but yet not completely raw. So, and sometimes it's a texture thing. I know for my kids and for me, sometimes it's about a texture. So now we never ate scallops growing up, I'll be honest. Lots of people didn't eat, didn't eat them growing up. Um, it's kind of like, you know, my grandfather would talk about lobsters and how they never ate lobsters growing up, right? And many people here in Newfoundland will have heard that story about how lobsters were something that was only, um, you know, eaten in, in hard times and, you know, Pop would say they, he wouldn't even take lobster sandwiches to school because it was only the poor kids who took lobster sandwiches to school. So it's always always interesting to watch how we've evolved and now we can go to McDonald's and get a lobster sandwich for 18 bucks or something. <laughs> so now, so this is one of the butters and this is what we do is we just roll it up and keep it in the freezer. And these make great gifts, by the way, for anyone interested in, uh, in a little unique gift. Just some compound butter, rolled it up in parchment. And this one, like I said, is seaweed. And then you just slice pieces off it as I go to use it. And by the crowd next door digging up, the, digging up the ground. So I apologize if it's a little bit loud. And so you can see immediately that that rock is nice and hot. So there we go. Get that all nice and buttered. And lay our pieces of scallop out onto it. So you're really just barely warming up. And of course the butter's been infused with all that delicious seaweed. Here we go, that should do it. Now I talked about one of the things about the seaweed and, and you know how we dry it up on the, up on the line and you can always pick, when you go picking seaweed, you can wait until a good storm and pick it right off the beach if you want. Um, but other than that, you don't want to go to the beach and pick what's already lying around on the beach. Actually, we're really fortunate now. My neighbor, if you guys can see this, she's just started the first wild harvest um, kelp farm here. And they're mapping the ocean floor at the moment and figuring out the biomass of kelp in about four different areas around the island so that we can actually put a product like this out into the market. And I'm happy enough to, uh, luckily enough, to get to play with some of the stuff that she's been making. Super exciting. Like when you think about the next generation of, of how we can sustainably harvest from the sea and what we can do with it. Like those kind of opportunities have only begun to scratch the surface. And so, um, yeah, it's really nice to see, you know, we talk about all the time is how we're going to keep this, uh, these products, how we're going to take care of them. And, you know, we've seen lots of times what happened in some of the, in our fisheries and what's happening all the time you know, with our, our lack of awareness of how these things should be harvested and our resources should be taken care of. So it kind of gives us a great opportunity. So this is a bit of black um, seaweed salt, actually. And it gets black because after I harvest and dry it, I'll smoke it. Uh, before it gets really, really dry, I'll often smoke it in the smoker. And then what you get is like a black seaweed salt. And it's absolutely delicious. And so I'm going to just put a little bit of that on here. Now it's not straight up salt. Uh, so it's a little mix of, it's the seaweed, half seaweed and half salt. So it, don't be alarmed by the amount I put on. Uh, and then one of the other things that comes out of the, out of the scallop, and some of you might recognize the ever open scallops. There's like a big, well, it's the gonad, they call it, right? And it's a bright orange, bright, bright, it's like a bright dark orange, or it's a, it's a white. And I dehydrate them, you know, in that spirit of nose to tail. Um, we, you know, I do everything I can to kind of use every piece that comes out of these scallops to make it, you know, worth the harvest. The, 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 what they call the skirts will come off and I'll dehydrate them and I'll use them in soup stocks and kombu um, stocks. And, uh, and so these are the gonads. They don't get salted. They just get dehydrated. They're super salty. Um, and sometimes I'll soak them actually before I dehydrate them. And then they just become like, it's my, I call it my Parmesan cheese from the sea. And so these, I don't know how good you can see the color, but it's a really bright orange color. And 
and that just creates that umami flavor. And, you know, if anyone enjoys cooking, the umami flavor is where it's at. It's hard to find. And, and when you get it, it's, one, it's certainly one to be appreciated. And so there's one of the, the kelps that we picked. And here's another one that we picked. And these are some just dried cranberries. So it's cranberry season. And it's funny, in the book, we did a, a talk the other day. And there's a part of the book, it's called All Hands Are Sup. And so for anyone in Newfoundland, you can absolutely relate, relate to that. Uh, and certainly in the Maritimes, right? Berry picking season, it's where it's at. And I'd have guests come out on the beach with me. And, um, and you know, on their way out, they would say, you know, what is, what's all the people doing in the fall of the year, pulled over on the beach, all pulled over on the sides of the road, and everyone's up in the field, out in the barrens picking. And I would say to them, oh, you mean why are all hands are up? Well, it's berry picking season. And you go on to tell them about berry picking season, of course, that very difficult for people that come out of New York and Toronto to relate to what berry picking season is. But of course, us here in, in the Maritimes, we, we know it all too well. And so always remember, you know, great fondness for, for me anyway. So we have, um, this is some dried cranberries and if you're lucky enough to get out and get some cranberries still. Now that the, the frost has gotten to them, they're, they're not, uh, they're super sweet. Well, I wouldn't, maybe they're not super sweet because they got that gorgeous tart to them, which I really love. There you go. And so, yeah, and then that just gives you the bit of tartness with the cranberry. You got the, um, you know, you got the umami flavor coming from the, the dehydrated scallop row, and then you got the black seaweed salt. So it just gives a little opportunity for, for people to taste a wide variety of flavors and something that's really done pretty simply. You know, it's not, uh, it's not something that's laborious and, uh, and takes a lot of time, but it gives me the opportunity, like I did with you guys, to share about all those things that are so important to me. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and so if you want to try that someday, when you're out, in the, out at the cabin, you stick your rock over the fire and bring in a few scallops and, uh, and enjoy them like that. Uh, we've got lots of, you know, there's lots of little things that you can do all the time to increase that value of that story that, that you're trying to tell. And for me, sorry gotta have a cup of tea, right? So as I said to people when they come to Newfoundland, I was like, listen, nothing happens in Newfoundland without a cup of tea. And if you come to Newfoundland and someone invites you in for a cup of tea, it's kind of like a non-negotiable. Like you can't say, well, I've had enough tea today. <laughs> Don't say you had enough tea ever <laughs> because the reason why they're inviting you in is because they are interested in getting to know you a little bit more. And if a Newfoundlander wants to sit with you, whether you're in the shed having, having that cup of tea or sitting around their, their kitchen table, um, it's really where you get a chance to learn about a place and, uh, and the people who are in it. And let's face it, you know, this, the kind of work that we're all in, um, we've all realized that now it's about that discovery of that place that you're going to. So it's how do we share that? How do we share that place? And, you know, I think during COVID, I think it was a time when I really realized that I wasn't selling, it wasn't about the food, right? For the extravagantness of the food that I did. I mean, I would do six courses around an open fire with six to eight people. Everything from the salt was made that I would make from the ocean water to you know, the row and the harvest of this and the, the homemade bread that mom, had have to, mom ended up having to make for me and the tea buns and every single element almost of that meal was made by hand and it was an enormous undertaking and I say all the time that I kind of created this monster of an experience one that was very difficult to pass on to someone else so you could I could grow the business um but it's I realized during all this that it was so it wasn't always about the food. And to be honest, and Jonathan um, with Genus and I, we say this all the time. It's like, it's not about the food, really. Like, it's about the food and how it relates to the place. It's not about what you serve. I hear it all the time. Yes, but Lori, you're a chef. You worked in kitchens and restaurants your whole life. And I was like, yes, but that is not what it's about. Because when I go into the woods, I, br I can bring in a few mackerel wrapped up in a bit of tin foil and candy and sausages sometimes, right? So when I'm talking about authentic, <laughs> you know, that's what sometimes authentic is. So these, the, and the dishes that I make all relate to the story that I want to tell. So when I'm serving codfish stew or cod's head stew, 
that's the opportunity for me to talk about all the things in that dish that make um, that part of who I am and who, and the food here, right? And so I'd be caught up in all these details of all the stuff that needed to be made for this experience in terms of the food. And when I, and when I, during COVID, when I couldn't take people across the beach and I couldn't feed them anymore and I couldn't take them into barns because I felt I couldn't feed them with the restrictions around food, I felt like, how am I going to show up for my business? And so it, again, like it really forced me to start thinking about what it is I do and how it is that I want people to feel when they leave. And that is what it absolutely, like it, it absolutely boiled down to that. Um, and how was, not, how was I going to give them a food experience without feeding them, right? So for those of you who are working with people who are starting up businesses or all, all of us in this business, you know, I really challenge you to think about what it is that you want them to feel when they walk away from you. Because, um, I mean, it's actually, it's actually the most important part. And when I started 10 years ago, I always dis really dismissed, like, my place in that story. And it was sort of, I coupled it with, like, my lack of experience. And me and my story was kind of irrelevant. And I figured, I remember saying this all the time, like, I don't really have stories. Like, you know, I was 30 two at the time. And I was like, I don't know, what am I going to talk about? I don't have stories. I was like, I didn't have my mom's stories of like waking up, um, with, you know, they lived without electricity and I mean, mom's only 73, I think. So, you know, when she would wake up and the, and the windows would be frosted in the morning, she like scrapes, she says she remembers like scraping all the frost off the windows in the winter before pop got up and lit the wood stove and they all huddled in the kitchen. And I never had my nan stories. My nan was nine years old and it was her job to make the bread for all nine of her siblings. Cause she was, uh, she was, yeah, she was nine. And so she had to make the bread for all the family because her mother was gone down making fish. So her mother at 4 a.m. would leave and go down to the wharfs and down the stages. And that was her, the women's role then in part of the fish. And so and, you know, and mom talked about carrying wood to school and how they would walk four miles to school, kilometers to school and, and four kilometers back. And when they come home, sometimes lunch was as simple as a big, thick slice of homemade bread, you know, slattered in butter with molasses on it. And maybe some, like, uh, she said she remembered coming home and she'd smell that Nan was cooking sound bones. And now, and she's like, she, we were never very happy about it. So the sound bone, and the whole reason why cod sounds was called cod sounds, the sound bone is, uh, is tucked up in, the sound bone is the vertebrae, right? And it was often cut out and it was meat. Sometimes there was meat left on it, like quite a bit of meat. And so they were salted and my grandfather would always salt the sound bones and mom says they remember coming home and smelling sound bones for lunch and day. She says, we'd be right grossed out. <laughs> but, but I think it was uh, truly a time when they weren't, weren't complaining about the food that was pushed in front of them for sure. You know, and, and I remember saying to people like, yeah, but I'm not like that old salty, you know, fisherman who sits on the end of his boat and tells the stories about the hardships of life and being a fisherman and what that was like. And, and I just kept thinking to myself, like comparing myself that, you know, how am I going to tell those stories of grit and those stories of like this hard life that, that, that was, that was growing up. And it was like, well, I didn't really have those stories. Like, you know, I grew up on a land farm and dad was a teacher and a fisherman and mom was home with us. Like you try to compare, life is pretty cushy <laughs> growing up. You wanted water, you turned on the tap, you know, you flushed the toilet. And it was very different time and only like one generation ago. So when I started telling, talking to people out on the beach, I left my piece out of it, like my piece of food and and you know what it meant to me and I was just telling everyone else's stories and I realized at one point that the story that I wanted to tell wasn't actually all about um that story of hardship right for me I wanted to start telling a, a different story I wanted to tell a story of hope and like a bright future while still embracing the past and how could I weave those stories so that the story went from where we were to where we are now and where I think we can go. So I wanted to tell the story of up, right? This place is, we're putting our food on the map. 
we're going to we're going to change how people think about food in Newfoundland and and it was that and when I decided that that's what was really going to make my the you know the stories that I was telling complete um, because I wanted to keep our food on the table for the next generation now that was less you know on the minds of my grandmother and mom and pop and um when I was, you know, I was in 1992 in the collapse of the cod fishery, I was 15 years old. And I remember my, you know, that story of my teenager years was leave Newfoundland. There's nothing here for you. The fishery's gone and, and go somewhere else and do better for yourself. And that's not uncommon. Like anyone sitting here today can, um, can certainly relate, I'm sure, to, to that time in Newfoundland and when the cod fishery was, was shut down. And it certainly was a time we'll, none of us will ever forget. But it definitely shaped my ideas around Newfoundland and, and what life would be here and the, kind of the expectation of it. And, you know, it really wasn't until I had my own kids, um, and my daughter's 11 now, my son's nine, that um, I, I started to really understand how much I love this place. I mean, as a teenager, it wasn't really on top of my mind, right? Uh, but, you know, it was, it became so important to me that that not be the story that I tell them. And I, like, so many times I've said, I've said to them and said to people, like, I will not tell this story. This is not the story I'm going to tell my children. And this is not the story that I want to tell travelers when they come here. And so how do I tell a new story and how do I weave that piece and how do I, how do I weave my part in that story that I wanted to tell? Because those are the ones that I really believed in. Like I really believed in these, in, in this story of hope here and prosperity and opportunity and all that was here that was yet to discover from the seaweed farms that Diana started to the regenerative agriculture that's happening here to the restaurant scene and the, the chefs here who are working so hard to put our food on, on, the, on the place for visitors to come and taste it. Like, that's what I wanted to tell. I wanted to talk about the, the urchin industry and, and how we're switching some of those industries and how we're changing our fishing practices and all the good that's coming from it. And I remember listening to uh, uh, an interview with a lamb farmer one time out of the Faroe Islands. I'm in love with the Faroe Islands, um, and uh, and I was listening to this lamb farmer being interviewed, and you know he went on uh, to say that so Faroe Islands is part of Denmark, and he was you know a 70 year old man, but it's now, but at, at that point, and he was saying years ago that the priest would come over from Denmark over to the islands, and he came would come over to visit only every now and then because the islands are right smack dab in the middle of nowhere, and. So when he would come over, he would be hosted by, um, by a family, of course, right? And he, he, re he said to me that uh, he remembered, like, people feeling so ashamed of the food that they had to feed them, right? Now, the Faroe Islands is pretty sparse, mostly known for you know, fish and lamb, right? And, and seabirds. And I immediately related to that because that's what we grew up on, right? Dead, fished, and hunted, and, and, and uh, you know, so we grew up on a lot of that same food. Anyway, it sort of told, it just jarred me in my tracks because I remember after the fishery, Dad went to work in sales. And I'm sure he went to work in, I mean, he was a teacher too, but he loved being on the road. If no other reason than to collect stories, we could come home and tell us all about him. So, the, the, you know, the these storytellers that we surround ourselves with are worth every moment that you spend with them, right? And um, so he would come home sometimes and say to mom, right, oh, so-and-so is coming in from Toronto, you know, some businessman, and, uh, and of course, Toronto, no doubt, right? So it was like the place where all the Newfoundlanders went, and well, you went up there to do better for yourself, and if someone from Toronto was coming here, you know, and I remember mom, mom was mortified, she would get herself in a spin about this businessman and dad was going to bring home from Toronto and oh my god what am I going to feed him she said well I can't feed him old I grew up on a land farm dad was a fisherman she said well I can't feed him old lamb and fish right and that stuck to me and like she would go out of her way and she would go and make like lasagna or something and like like anyway it's now when you when I think of it now I try to I can't even conceptualize for a moment like because when people come here 
I'm like getting turs and ducks and everything that I can feed them to say, this is the food here. And it, you know, he spoke about the shame that was surrounding their food in the Faroe Islands. And it absolutely, like I said, it, it stopped me in my tracks because that was, I could relate to that because that was what mom would talk about. Like she was almost ashamed to feed this old rough grub mom. And mom would still say, like, mom, like your cooking's amazing. Like it's so beautiful and delicious. And, and it is, and but she, that's only a bit old rough grub. So it's so interesting how like mom's rough grub is the food that like warms my heart and my soul and can't wait till the raisin bread comes out of the oven at Christmas and the turkey dinner and whatever she puts her hands to, it's like, that's the food because that's my memories of the food, right? And so it was always so much more uh, important, right? And so it really became my driving force. Like, how am I going to make sure that the next generation don't think like that? Now, you, can, you, know, you can't control what people think, but it was more of, what is my part going to be and how I share that story of hope and that driving force of what I absolutely believe in my soul that the food here is the, is on her and takes the you know world-class stage with food of anywhere. And so it was a new story to tell. And so it took me some time to sort of figure out how I was going to do it. And I remember I went, I was in very picking with mom and I said to her, we had the fire going, of course, mom had brought in all the little china cups, the tea, right? The, the, the little china cups all wrapped up in cup towels because there was no like, just no camping gear and Yeti mugs coming into the woods back then, right? So, and even today when we go to the woods, Mark got all the teacups wrapped up in the cup towels and, and we were sitting around the fire. I mean, my daughter couldn't even, I don't even think she was walking in. So, you know, 10, 11 years ago. And we picked a few berries and we're sitting around a fire and we're having a cup of tea and um, telling a few old stories. And, and I said to my mom, how, imagine if people could come here and they could do this. And I was like, why? It's like, just sit around the fire and have a cup of tea, have a tea bond or whatever, and listen to a few old stories. And of course, my mom, in all her love, and she says to me, you know, because I I was finished, I stopped working when I had the kids. And I said, um, Mom, wouldn't that be wonderful if they could just come and feel like this, like we do right here, right now, like in on the barrens, the fire. And mom's like, honey, that's right, sweet. She said, but I don't think anyone's going to pay for that. So let me assure you, people will pay for that. Um, now it's not as easy as that, as I, as I learned, but, um, you know, for me, it was like, how do I take that simple idea of that feeling that I wanted to give people and how can I, how can I share it with them over and over and over? And how can I create something that when people left their time with me, that they would feel that in their heart. And like I say, when I want that, when they leave Newfoundland, I just want them to to leave with a little piece of new plan in their heart and feel about it the way that I do. So, you know, the future of all of our food and all of our culture and our food ways, it lives in the stories that we tell today. Food culture changes. You can bring your heritage recipes, your heritage culture into today. And, but culture is always changing, right? We never grow up picking mushrooms here in Newfoundland. This generation, of children growing up today are going to pick mushrooms because my kids are going to school and teach them about the mushrooms. And my neighbor's kids now take her kids out picking mushrooms. But that makes it a place when culture evolved and the food evolved. And it's okay to tell those stories of evolving culture. As a matter of fact, it's the purpose of, of what I do now is that how do I how do I help change that and grow and evolve so that we get to a place where it's the whole picture and it's our whole story of hope and growth and, you know, evolving and understanding um, all this. And so it became, the, it became my purpose um, was to tell that side of the story. And so I challenge you um, to ask, you know, your, your operators to just stop and intentionally think about the stories that matter to you. Like I say that I do this all the time for the next generation because I want this food to be on their plates for generations to come um but i do this so much for my the generation that has passed right um and that really took care of these resources for us and taught us and passed on all this this you know from cleaning rabbits to picking berries and 
And so, so much of what I do, I, I do for them too. Um, I lost both my grandparents this year and, um, you know, I'm so grateful that I took the time to sit with them and listen to their stories because I get to retell them now and, and they, those, they get to live on. Um, I started all of this by sitting down and recording an interview with them years ago and asking them about their food. And from there, I went on to collect, like people have sent me recipe books in the mail after places I spoke and filled with like their their neighbors' handwritten recipes. Um, I have collected books, lots of them from Labrador. This one's from Mikovic, the community cookbook. Um, this one's from Happy Valley. And this one was dedicated to the seniors in Labrador. Like, this is a time, this is where the food comes from. This is the stories. I went down to collect, I have binders of stories from people, from sheds I sat in and um, you know, from here to Bonnet this to the, the Twilling Gate and on. And these are all stories that I collected from people and recipes. And so you're not going to sit around one day and hope that your food and food stories and cultures fall into your lap. You have to go out and find those stories. And now I get to share them as part of my story and what I do. And my grandfather's, um, and his, his famous words, he would always say to me, he would say, ah, you know, and sit back, right, and always rubbing his knuckles, and he would say, you know, Lori, I mean, he says, life's about time and chance and circumstance, and so that's what I truly feel about today. For all of us in this industry, and all of us helping people build their businesses in this industry, that this time and chance and circumstance is, is for us to, uh, is for us to shape and mold, and so that brings me to an end. <laughs> so thank you everyone so 